We're jumping right in with Simon. It's a volatile world out there. <laughs> Trump. Um, I said I wasn't going to say his name, but I did. Volatile. How do we insulate ourselves, but also why is it still so important to look beyond our borders? Well, Michael, am I mic'd? Can you hear me? Can we hear him? Yeah. Good. Michael this morning talked about opportunity, and for me, the international market is significant for three reasons. The first of all, it's growing. Uh, domestic markets are flat in the US, Canada, Europe. International market is growing. We've got skiers, a million Australians that travel overseas to ski every year, a million Brits, a million Germans, increasing number of skiers from South America, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico. And in Asia, we've got South Koreans, the Chinese, there's already half a million Chinese skiing. And that number's gonna grow exponentially in the next decade. They're gonna be here soon, so they're gonna fill our slopes, fill our beds. They also spend a lot of money. The average traveler to Canada, international traveler, spends twice as much as a domestic traveler. In America, the average traveler spends, four, international traveler spends $4,800 stays for 18 days. The Chinese in America, they're now our biggest spenders in the States, even though they're number five in terms of arrivals. They spend $75 million a day. That's $1,000 per person a day. So they're significant spenders. Thirdly, the lastly, it's, it's, it's more than tourism. Um, what we're seeing is an increasing number of people deciding to move to the mountains to move to work to play. Just read Ski Gallon the magazine. Increasing number of boomers moving to Whistler. They're moving there for lifestyle reasons, and we want those retirees. You know, they're, they're, they're spending money. They're younger. They're not like yesterday's retiree. Uh, so, and they, they're investing. They're investing in businesses in South Carolina. The Chinese are coming in. They're playing a round of golf, coming back in the clubhouse and saying, yeah, I'll buy the club. We've sold $46 million, uh, $46 million worth of golf clubs to the Chinese. So it's not just about tourism. There's a significant relationship between tour tourism and economic development and investment. Anybody feel some drool when China was mentioned? <laughs> and they're looking for 300 million people doing on snow activity by 2022 when they have the games in Beijing. 300 million! <laughs> that's a big number. $1,000 a day, that's a lot of dollars. But Aspen, you guys have been, and Chrissy, you guys have been so proactive. But we had a lot of conversations about this panel before we got here, and what connected for me was how you connect with the internationals emotionally. Mm -hmm. This is expenditures that they don't have to do, they want to do. Right. How do you connect with the international market emotionally to get them to your resort? Well, first you have to really understand them, right? You have to be willing to listen and, and not look at um, all gas in, in a homogenous way. So that then you understand what it is they're looking for. People are going on vacation this is a stressful world, it's a stressful time. They really need a return. They need to relax and enjoy and have a good quality. So um, we deploy a lot of resources um, against it. We work really collaboratively, collaboratively with the lodging community. And I think that's something that we take a lot of pride in and it has been an incredible success driver for us is how we have worked so long together with them in concert versus um, sometimes I think you can be at odds the different players in your community and, and we just are blessed not to have that but the um, emotional connection is it, it's really about how we run our business and who we are and then how we share that similar to what we heard a lot about this morning and you know coming up next year we'll have an interesting campaign to share that's a bit more emotionally driven and um, really making priorities to do the right thing as a company um, instead of just trying to make money as a company. So I want to ask a follow-up because you mm -hmm. started by saying you have to understand your international mm -hmm. markets before you can really know how to go after them. Mm -hmm. um, you understand a lot about a lot of international markets. Can mm -hmm. you give us some insight into them? So anything in particular? Well, you mentioned uh, UK travelers, how they might be a little bit, so if you uh, lose one, they're a little sure. slower to come back. Sure. Or what gaps, who fills what gaps? Who travels in January? Right. Why are they filling the midweek gaps? Things like that. Okay, so for those of you in the room who might be looking to um, really almost start, or you're on the beginning part of really trying to drive an international guest, um, understanding when they travel and why, you know, and for the length of time, so the, the Brits, for example, will like to come. Their, their version of spring break, their midterms, 
maybe around Easter, they'll tend to come for about the six or seven night window. And we saw we had a, a really tremendous UK presence prior to 9-11. And everyone fell, I have it all graphed out, everyone fell after that. And the rebound, the Brits were the slowest to rebound for us. And um, it had a lot to do with their, they were more conservative with their spend. They didn't, they, you know, they wanted to, they were more cautious. Whereas the Brazilians, our friends in Brazil, they kept coming um, and um, they rebounded much more quickly because it felt more like home and they had that connection. The Aussies like January. So if you need January midweek holes to fill, knock on their door. Um, and then towards the end of the season for Easter and such, you've got um, the Mexicans. Um, Canada's doing great with Mexico this year. Good job, <laughs> everybody. Um, Coming a little further north <laughs> this year. <laughs> that Congratulations. <laughs> and, um, and then Brits like us too. So I think that it just, and also when you're looking to grow and you're saying, okay, I wanna, I wanna get more international, really try to identify what it is you're trying to accomplish. Is it midweek stays? Is it you wanna get people who buy more food and beverage or more ski school or come a certain time of year? Because different markets will, will answer, solve different problems for your business. I saw you nodding a lot, but get, we have to talk to Sammy before we get back to Simon, right? So Sammy, what sticks out for me was especially after JMO gave his speech and he's talking about the privilege to inspire. Well, Best of the Alps is doing it exceptionally well and they're telling stories. I would say they're the leaders in storytelling at the moment. Can you tell us a bit about that, why you've gone that direction, which um, is a bit of an industry leader right now? Well, actually, we're a non-commercial organization. We're more of a marketing corporation of these, I call them original uh, alpine uh, destinations and brands. And um, As, if people don't know the list, it's um, St. Moritz, Kitzbühel, Davos, Mejev, uh, <laughs> Chamonix. Um, it, it is the originals. It right. Is, yeah. And uh, we were fortunate enough to, uh, from the beginning, have international visitors because it was the Brits uh, who were the first ones to came to climb the mountain, of course, then stayed in the winter time uh, in the hotels that opened specially uh, for the British uh, in the winter time, um, and um, then it moved on. The Americans came. Then the villages understood there is a difference between the British and the <laughs> Americans. Actually, they speak the same language, but they're quite different, and uh, was a learning process. And um, because um, there are so many great commercial websites out there uh, where you can do a million things, um, and um, we said uh, we want to do something different. Uh, first of all, we don't have to be commercial with what we do. Um, on, on, on the web, and uh, we really went into deep, deep uh, storytelling um, where we try to across the personalities and uh, their stories and their products to show what the DNA is of each uh, individual destination. And through that, we're showing um, the roots, we're showing um, the authenticity of these 11 uh, originals um, and only because of the rich history and everything that happened in the past two to 300 years, that's how long we're in business with uh, our towns, um, only through these stories, uh, only through uh, this, this time of um, and this history, we have these personalities and we, we could create these products and tell all those, I think right now it's about 120 stories uh, coming from these uh, 11 uh, destinations. And for all of you who are not that old, and if you're um, <laughs> sitting there going, well, I'm not Aspen, I'm not Kitzbühel, how do you attract international travelers? Um, you've got a lot of data on this, and you've got to be ready. What does ready mean? Well, I think, yeah, and, and related to Europe, you know, I've got a story. Uh, when I was in Switzerland, I was working in Verbier, Switzerland, many years ago in the 80s, and the tourism office director called me and he said, hey, you, you've got a PhD on skiing, you know everything. He said, why, why is Zermatt getting all those Japanese skiers? So I went away, did a bit of research, went back in a week later. I said, well, it's because they've employed 30 Japanese ski instructors. And he said to me, well, we're not going to do that. We only employ Swiss people. And that was his answer. And I said, well, you're not going to attract the Japanese then. Um, the message is you need to adapt. We need to understand each individual market in terms of, you know, the Chinese are looking for big brands now, high expensive, high shops. Mm -hmm. They want instruction, they love to learn. The Indians are looking for vegetarian food. Uh, the Brits want cheap wine. You know, you can go on and on. <laughs> if you 
But if you generalize what travelers are looking for, and that goes to back what Sam says, they're looking for an authentic experience. They're looking for a social connection to your uh, destination, your resort. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was interesting listening to, to the conversation about Airbnb and Expedia. And we've done research on to show that it's not just price people are shoot, choosing Airbnb. It's because they're getting a, a deeper social connection, uh, an emotional engagement with the destination, with the brand, or with mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so hotels, to respond, need to offer that engagement. Um, but as a, going back to, to your question, it's a need, needing to understand the behaviors of those markets and getting ready. Because they, otherwise, if you're not ready, they'll come and they'll go somewhere else. Once they come, I mean, I was in, the, uh, in Aspen a couple of weeks ago at the Limelight. I think you've been there as well, Limelight Hotel. It was Peter. full of Australians who've come back year after year after year, regardless of exchange rates, regardless of the political climate and walls going up left, right, and center. They'll come back if you provide an incredible experience for them. Mm -hmm. But then there's got to be a bit of fear. I mean, the Swiss guy, we only hire Swiss. And that's a bit of a reluctance where it's like, well, we don't want to become um, Little Russia, which Courchevel was starting to get nicknamed. Um, how do you hold on to your identity? Because people are coming for your identity. And yet, if you become overrun by one sector or one nation, mm -hmm. how do you hold on to your identity? Uh, Christy, I'm going to have you talk to this. Um, right. I think that was, you hit it though. It's they're coming because you are different because they want to experience what you offer. They want to eat your steak or your but it's barbecue. It's a fear, right? That's stopping people a little um, bit from it, hiring it, it, the it, Japanese. I would say it may be um, a fear that they should get over. It's uh -huh. not going to change who you are to share it. Well, tell us, like, what are the numbers for your like? Aspen relies on the international market more heavily than most. Statistically, we could be a quarter to, to a third of our business could be from crossing the border. Um, and that is significant for us, obviously. Um, we, our loyalty rate is quite high, including our domestic visitors. And that has a lot to do, actually, our ski school. And I think one of the things that we've benefited and leveraged really well to be successful internationally is the schools. Um, we, have, we pride ourselves in having you know, the best school out there, we have probably 12 languages, 15 languages in our schools, um, and they are, they act as hosts. Similar to the Airbnb example that Simon gave is they book their tickets and they book their dinners and they go out with them and they have this, this very like host-like connection and of course they learn. And so um, that, th those statistics, that loyalty is, is, is north of 75% for us on repeat guests to the resort if they've been in our schools. So, and then, and that's I think where the international has gone hand in hand with our loyalty because of our schools being so successful. Now, Simon, you uh, have looked a lot of the numbers and you know that, what does it mean to be ready for China specifically? Um, go ahead. Well, to put it into context, you know, we, we've got 120 million skiers worldwide. Um, right now there's five million Chinese skiing. Half a million of them are traveling overseas to ski. They're, at the moment they're going to South Korea, to Switzerland, um, uh, Japan. Europe, Japan. Japan. But they will come here. Mm -hmm. You know, as I say, you, you said, they're, they're planning to grow uh, winter sport participants uh, up to 300 million people by 2022, by the time they host, host the Olympics. Usually when the Chinese say they're going to do something, they do. Yes. But even if you get half that number, and then 10% or 5% of them travel overseas. We're going to see them. Mm -hmm. So we need to be ready for them, and we need to understand that market. We need to have our, our toes in that market already, building those relationships. Um, because if we don't, our competitors uh, will, will gain them. At the moment, they're traveling mainly in the summer. Um, as I say, they're, our, they're the biggest spenders already in the US. But they will start to turn to winter sports, as I say, because of the impetus on, on skiing over there right now they will translate and we will uh, receive those Chinese visitors. So I don't know if you two can talk to experience of what they're looking for mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, we know from the summer they're looking for you know, high-end brands, but, but the winter uh, participants spend even more money mm -hmm. in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to someone from Utah yesterday and they're coming over to the Utah to the parks. They love the parks, but they will come skiing and the, and the skiers, the winter visitors spend more money. When uh, the Chinese market, the numbers are like 68% of the slopes in China are for beginners. They have 618 magic carpets already. They're installing them 
almost daily, it seems like, not actually, but um, so they're a beginner skier kind of market. And St. Moritz, I thought, was fascinating because 50% of the people who go to St. Moritz don't ski. And they hosted the World Championships. Can you tell us your insight into part of why they hosted the World Championships? Because this is this is mind-boggling to me. Uh, yes, I was fortunate enough uh, to be uh, there for the 2003 Ski World Championship, which took six years to actually get it. But uh, the prior uh, World Championship was in '74, and um, the problem uh, in the '90s um, when I worked there was that. Uh, people didn't recognize Samaritz as a ski resort anymore. It was a resort for horse races on the frozen lake, polo, um, it was uh, five-star gourmet restaurants, it was uh, whatever kind of events. Um, and yes, okay, there, apparently there was also a little bit of skiing. And in order to change that image dramatic, dramatically, um, we needed those ski world championships to remind the people um, that it's a ski uh, resort. So you really have to take care of uh, who you become and who you want to be, actually. And uh, this might, might be painful and take actually a long time to go back where you were at some point if you lose control somehow over your own product. Yeah. I, I just find that fascinating. Let's host the World Championships to remind the world <laughs> you can ski in St. Moritz. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? I'm like, but at the same time, I live in Canmore. I'm 20 minutes away. And when I moved here, I'm, I'm, I'm a winter person through and through. And I was shocked that this is a summer destination, 100%. My family would never come here outside of ski season. It's like, why would I go to the mountains if there ain't snow on them? There's just there's no reason. But this is a summer destination. Christy, you need to, there's a bit of that give and take within Colorado of mm -hmm. summer, winter, mm -hmm. and can you talk a bit about that? Sure. And the importance of summer for internationals. Absolutely. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for this mountain travel um, community to look at the international opportunity in summer. Aspen's successful in the summer, Jackson, um, Canada. There's a lot of resorts that still really want and need a lot more business in the summer. And Simon, Simon said that the, um, the Chinese, three quarters of the Chinese travelers that come to the United States or come anywhere are coming in the spring, summer, and fall. And many of you probably know what the Maroon Bells is. I was out there. I, was, I had just come back from Germany. I was super jet lagged. I was up at three in the morning every day. So I decided in September to go see the sunrise at the Maroon Bells because I'd never done it. I'd never been up that early with all the colors and everything's great. So I think I'm a genius. I get out there. I, it was 6, 5.30 in the morning. I got the last parking spot at the Bells. And I, have, I wish I had brought this video. I took a video of the people standing there taking pictures. And it was, I think, 12 Americans and about 500 international guests dying just because of the parks. And, and I think there's true, true growth opportunity is is really the summer traveler, particularly in China. When you think about 300 million people, mm. that's the size of the United States. Well, I, I, some of you may know this brand USA who promote America to the world. They, they just invested in a movie. $10 million they put into this movie. This is market, destination marketeers making a movie. $10 million on national parks, wild adventures, targeting specifically the Chinese because they have the fastest growing IMAX uh, business in the world to bring them to America's national mm -hmm. parks. And, and it, it'll work. Because it does they work. Well, it does parks. work. Sammy's got a story of why every Indian wants to go to Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it was uh, kind of a coincidence also, I guess. Uh, there uh, was this uh, movie uh, which was shot in uh, Switzerland where uh, there was this famous Bollywood dancing on uh, green meadows and flowers and snow-capped mountains, and it became a hit. And uh, every movie after that wanted to become a hit had to have these images because the people were so fan about it and, and uh, wanted to see more of this. And, uh, but it was, was a coincidence because this uh, filmmaker met this guy from Switzerland who told him, I'm going to arrange everything for you. I have a bus. We're going to tour across the Alps together. And uh, I know the best locations. Um, and um, since then, it's true, the Indians um, are coming uh, in, in masses, but you have to be 
ready. They're coming first of all in April and May. Is your mountain resort ready to host people during April and May? And what do you offer them? And then also, um, of course, uh, food-wise, you have to be um, ready for that too. Of course, they eat vegetarian pizza, but they cannot eat vegetarian pizza for uh, so many days. You have to have a little bit more uh, of a variety. And um, what we talked about before, um, I disagree. It is important that you have um, foreign people from those markets where you want to have um, visitors from. Um, in Grindelwald, um, they already established 30 years ago a Japanese incoming office. It was only one, I think, two persons. But from that moment, um, the overnights went up because the Japanese had to be felt secure about being there. They could talk to somebody in Japanese um, and uh, that would take care of them. Um, the Chinese are looking for a little bit more, yes, social uh, interaction, experiences and so on. But still, what you said, um, um, when they go skiing, they want to have clear instructions and they want to learn to ski in maybe three days. So yes, you do need mm -hmm. a, a Chinese ski instructor at some point that tells them exactly what to do and not a Swiss guy with uh, speaking some English trying to explain uh, uh, to a Chinese how to learn to ski. It's like they said in the panel earlier today uh, when Dan was saying you have to put forward what you're hoping to attract. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can't have all men saying, we want to hire women. Like You need to put a face forward, a foot forward with mm -hmm. that intention. But how quickly do you adapt to trends? I, I can't dance. Or I thought I could, and then I went to Chile and I went to the clubs after training in Portillo, and I realized Chileans and South Americans, they know how to dance, I don't. <laughs> how quickly do you adapt to trends, making nightclubs that, adhere, like that accommodate the international market? Well, you don't have to. You could say, well, we don't want to change our product, our service, uh, and that's fine if it's not in your plan. Uh, but you know, the Colorado resorts have been very successful attracting the South Americans because they've invested in nightclubs, in high-end drinks, make sure they have high-end clothing, ski equipment for that particular market. So it's very important to adapt um, and, and to monitor. You mentioned at the beginning about how uh, volatile the environment is right now. It's always volatile. A any international, any international marketers here in this room will tell you. It's, it's. There's a lot of uncontrollables. Mm -hmm. There's exchange rates. There's visa problems. There's the political climate. There's your image. There's so many things that you have to deal with. But you, and, and big companies make mistakes. Disney, when they went into Paris, made a big mistake by not providing wine. We know the French want to drink wine at lunchtime. <laughs> Should, we all want to drink that. wine at lunchtime. <laughs> and, and they made a big mistake, but even the big companies get it wrong. So it's very, very important to understand and do your research, get in those markets. And, uh, you know, and, and even if you're a small operator, you're a small lodging operator, small resort, you can still um, find out that those numbers, work with partners. There's people in this uh, forum, you know, I've spoken to, the Sojourns, the Expedias, that you can work with to target uh, international travelers based on which market you're going for and target them with specific offers because mm -hmm. you might not be big enough like Vale to have a you know Mexican a, a Spanish speaking uh, Spanish website um, to attract your skiers but you can work with partners to attract international uh, markets well in best of the Alps I mean you guys are working as a group and we're speaking Christy about the, the networks that Aspen works with because I, I was I was legitimately going in I was like well Aspen's going to be this huge entity and they're going to exist on their own and not work with anybody and you're talking about a whole mm -hmm. campaign that they directed towards Australia because mm -hmm. you're like the dollar's going to go down we're going to target them yeah. we're going to get them in and I'm like well who identified that do you have somebody in there just looking at currency she's like no I googled it it's me <laughs> it's all Christy <laughs> and so talk about the relationships that you've developed and how everybody can leverage those kinds of relationships to tap into some of these ideas ideas that we're talking about. Right, so um, like the Alliance and Yeah, the and okay. well, how Aspen's done it, and it's a bit unique Aspen. It is, I but, think. Yeah, and but we'll, we'll touch on leveraging and whether it's through events or whether it's through working with other organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've, we've talked a lot about best practices and how to share them and, and um, what we did, Aspen is unique. It's, it's, it's an incredibly strong brand name and I got there um, 20 some years ago and um, there was no tax dollars of any kind in Aspen to drive tourism. And Snowmass had some, some finances, but Aspen had nothing. And Colorado as a state didn't have very much happening. And so because of that, it really ignited and inspired the, the private companies, the lodges and the 
the resorts to work in concert with one another to solve problems um, and go after this business, identify it, work with um, great travel partners that we have in these other countries. I mean, your tour operators are your marketers in these countries, and we leverage that um, beautifully. And you know, we've had Brazilians coming for 35 years in math. I mean, a lot of a long time. And so we we actually had a paid alliance with the lodges would cut the skiing company a check, write us the money, in, and we would then go out and do the marketing. And we, we did it as an all boats rise with the tide kind of kind of thing. Since then, we've adopted some more tax dollars. Colorado Tourism's got some tax dollars, but we still have this alliance, and it still drives. Um, a significant amount of our business and, and how effective we can be to collaborate. And it's something that I would encourage if people are struggling is to get together um, as best you can, even when you don't always get along, um, to we all get along. take it on. I just see and hear horror stories that I'm so blessed we don't have that kind of drama, yeah. but you see it in other places. And when then you're at odds with winter to summer. Yeah. So some of the, the, the new tax dollars we got largely go to non-ski efforts. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. That was a big no. part of it. And mm -mm. Best of the Elves mm -hmm. did not reinvent the wheel. In fact, <laughs> tell them about Exactly. Something. I mean, when we talked yesterday, um, um, somehow one of the strongest brands uh, right uh, uh, in, in North America, um, which was responsible for the birth of Best of the Elves, disappeared. It was Ski the Rockies. Um, uh, about 30 years ago, uh, Ski the Rockies came to Europe to attract the European skiers and take them over to North America and discover uh, the Rockies and ski there. And uh, nobody did so for Europe. Uh, that's why our founding fathers actually got together and said, uh, let's go to uh, North America and attract the North American skiers and bring them over to Europe, to uh, our villages and towns, and show them um, that uh, there is something else, uh, but uh, let's say purpose-built villages. Um, we do have villages that have uh, hundreds of years of history, and you can, yes, you can also ski. Uh, but so it's, it's really surprising um, that, that now you rethink of collaboration, um, doing uh, strategic um, marketing together with other destinations and other uh, areas, um, but Ski the Rockies was the brand uh, 30 years ago to attract skiers to uh, to come to North America, and it, it's disappeared. Simon's got something to say. He's itching here. You know? Give her. I can tell. You know? yeah. Body no, I, I wanted to get it in. I, just one point. Dan Sherman mentioned this morning that it's not all about skiing. You know, and with the international market in particular, mm -hmm. it's not all about skiing. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a diversification. You have to have a number of products and offer for them. What is it? One in five. You said 50% of people come to Samaritz don't ski. Was that right yes. yesterday? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know it's certainly one in five, some research last year, one in five visitors to the mountains in the winter does not ski. So if you don't have those products ready, and remember, these, are, these people are probably spending more money uh, than That's the good. people on the, on the slopes because they're in the shops, they're in the spas. So very, very important to have those products on offer for the international market. Mm -hmm. It also speaks to why you need unity in a, in a community to work mm -hmm. together to be attracting those dollars to come in. Mm -hmm. I know Canmore, they had a tax on their hotels, but the restaurants are benefiting from these incredible programs that were happening. And there's a bit of animosity starting. It's like, well, the hotels are paying in, the restaurants aren't. So there's, there's just developing those connections, starting them, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and I want to give you guys, we've talked about so many things important. It's the summer, China, different markets. I'm going to say a country because we're going to wrap up now and just answer with the first word that comes to mind. <laughs> China. Food. <laughs> wow. Australia. <laughs> um, beer. Iran. <laughs> Big potential, not for everybody in this room, but um, for certain countries in Europe, yes. Europe. Excellent. Thank you so much, Simon, Christy, Sammy. Big round of applause.